Good morning. Good morning. It's, it's Friday, Friday, May 22nd. 22nd. I'm, I'm Joe Haynes. Haynes. I'm the preaching, I'm the preaching elder at Beacon Church, Church in Victoria, uh, British Columbia. Columbia. And, and I want to welcome you to this Friday morning, morning devotional as we continue in our theme of uh, being, being ready, ready for, for the second, second coming of Christ. Christ. In, in particular, looking at the letter, the second, second letter of Peter, uh, uh, second, <laughs> second <laughs> Peter, and today uh, carrying on in chapter 3. Of second, second Peter, we're going to read verses uh, uh, one through seven, just for the sake of context, and, uh, and then discuss verses three through seven. And we talked about verses one to two yesterday. Uh, but before we do that, let's pray, pray. And, then, and then we'll begin. Father, I ask now that you would open our hearts and minds to receive your word. Uh, that as we think about these passages of scripture, these verses in, in Second Peter. Uh, that, that your Holy Spirit would uh, give us the reassurance and the confidence in your word and the truthfulness of your word because of the faithfulness of you who spoke. And we ask, Lord, that you would give us a greater faith in you, that we, we trust your word because we trust you. We believe your word because we believe you. And, Lord, you give us reasons even today to remember that your word is believable because you are believable. And we ask you to do this for the sake of the glory and in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's, let's look at 2 Peter uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and then I'm reading from the English Standard Version. This is now the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, Knowing this, this first of all, that scoffers will come the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. As we look at these verses, I think there's something we need to know about this, and I think that's what Peter is drawing his attention, our attention to, is that, that, that we're to know that, that in the last day, day there are going, going to be scoffers. In the last days, in the end times, Peter says, there will be scoffers. And, and we might say, well, there have always been scoffers. How is that different than there were scoffers at Peter's time? There were scoffers before in the Old Testament. There have always been scoffers about God and his people and his ways. And, and, but that's not exactly what Peter's saying. Peter's drawing out that in the last days, there will be scoffers who uh, follow their own sinful desires in, in the, the way that they scoff against and the way that they deride the scriptures. Uh, so, so they will follow their own sinful desires, not the scriptures. And that's, that's the point that, that we're being called, called to look for. And so, so again, look at verse 3. Knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. Uh, and, and so, so again, again, keep, keep the, the context in mind. Verse 2 talked about remembering the predictions of the holy prophets, the Old Testament. And, and the, the commandment of the Lord and Savior through your apostles, verse 2 says. So that's, that's the Bible, the Old and New Testament. And then, then verse 3 talks about those who, who are scoffers, who instead follow their own sinful desires. And that's why I say the, the, the point Peter is making is that in the last days there will be scoffers, particularly with regard to the Bible, who reject the Bible because they want to follow their own sinful desires. Sinful desires talks about you know, inner, inner motivations, inner, inner wants, inner, inner longings, and that's, that's what these that's, that's what these scoffers will follow. And it's not just that, that scoffers will come. There always been scoffers, and there always will be. Uh, although that's, that's certainly true, true. and there, 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 that, that scoffers have, have come, come, but it's what, what motivates their scoffing. It's, it's their, their own sinful desires. desires. And Peter, Peter says this is of first importance for his readers to know. The leads that he says in verse 1 are, are the, the ones he loves, is his beloved. And then I think the reason is that uh, we as believers, just as they did at this time, uh, we can easily be shaken by people's disdain, by people's very negative and strongly expressed opinions 
uh, about, about what, what we hold dear as Christians, Christians the beliefs that, that we hold dear. dear. Remembering that, that, that as Christians, Christians uh, people whose beliefs, beliefs are supposed to be shaped by the Bible, uh, we, we don't, don't choose what, what to believe. We, we, we begin to trust God, and as we trust Him, we begin to believe His Word. Well, we believe His Word because we trust God, but as we get to know the Word, uh, our opinions and our preferences come under uh, the authority of Scripture, and we are forced to begin to change our opinions and change our preferences by the teaching of Scripture. God does this as an act of the Holy Spirit in our hearts. So, so our, our convictions are not born out of our preferences, our desires, desire. our convictions are shaped by God's word, what he speaks and teaches through his word to us. us. And this, this is really important. important. These scoffers have the power in their scoffing to, to make us begin to wish that God's word wasn't true, to make us begin to uh, be embarrassed by what God's word says. And this, this is the point Peter, Peter wants to protect us from. from. And it may be a better way to say that is Peter wants to help us become, become resilient in our confidence in God's, God's word, uh, even in the face of scoffers who mock at it. Uh, so, so the scoffers don't care about the Bible. The, 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 they, they, they scoff about the Bible. The, the, that, that, that fact alone, that they don't care about what, what God has said, uh, means that we must bear in mind that their scoffing is nothing more than an opinion. It's, it's just, just their, their opinions. opinions. That's, That's all. all. You, know, you know, people believe all, all kinds of things, things don't, don't they? they? Uh, and uh, let, let me say again that these devotionals right now in Second Peter, Peter are based on my sermons, sermons that, that I preached uh, about four, four, four years, years ago in Second Peter. Peter. And, 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 and at, at that time, time I was struck by uh, an, an example of this, that, that people believe all kinds of odd things. Uh, it used to be that in the decades um, following, there was a famous uh, laboratory experiment back in the, in the 50s called the Miller-Urey uh, experiment. And, and uh, that, that, that experiment got many people hoping that one day scientists would prove that life can arise from non-living molecules. Uh, and unfortunately, that, that experiment led nowhere. I mean, there's been no evidence, no gains from that, no progress from that in figuring out how life could possibly arise from non-living things. Uh, and it's almost 70 years later, and still there's, there's no belief in um, abiogenesis, or abiogenesis, this, this idea that life comes from non-life. Um, and so it's just wishful, wishful thinking still in the scientific community. But... but more and more, more people. people. So, 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 I mean, first, first there's, there's a whole lot of people who believe that life arose on this planet from non-living chemical soup and goop. Right? right? And if, if there's so many people who believe that, and yet, yet there's no evidence for that, that why, why do they believe that? that? Well, well, again, so, so there, there are lots, lots of people, people today coming to believe that life on Earth uh, did, did not come from, from primordial soup, soup but... but uh, rather, rather from, from intelligent aliens visiting the, the planet a long, long time ago and seeding the planet with the beginnings of life. Uh, and and I, I think as, as I am shocked, shocked at that, that people, people who really believe, believe that, that, but I've met now multiple people who actually believe that, that educated people, people who believe that in one form or another. another. And, and what, what I, I want, want you to notice here is that, that People believe, believe these things, things whether it's uh, that life, life came from non-life, uh, like chemical, chemical soup, soup of, of, of naturally occurring compounds on planet Earth, Earth billions of years, years ago, or that, that life on Earth arose because intelligent aliens planted, planted it here. here. Uh, and then people, people don't, don't have any evidence for believing those things, things. But, but those things they, they believe because they, they want, want to believe them. them. Their, their sinful, sinful desires, desires lead them, them to, to look for explanations and think of ways that life could have happened here that, that exclude the possibility of God. So they, they ignore the Bible because of what they want, want it to be true. They certainly don't, don't get, get their beliefs from scientific evidence because uh, there, there is no evidence for aliens visiting the planet or, or there's, there's no evidence for you know, uh, life arising from chemicals. They, they also don't get their beliefs from the Bible. Uh, when, when they, they choose, choose to believe those things. things. 
I had, I had a really intelligent friend, friend of mine had said, said to me at the time, I wrote this, this, this sermon a long time ago, uh, uh, a friend had said, said to me um, that, that he likes asking people questions, for example, like, like this. this. It's, it's interesting, interesting that, that your, your personal beliefs happen to exactly match uh, the beliefs that are most common on TV and in our culture. Well, well tell, tell me, exactly what did you learn that convinced you uh, to, to change, change your mind and, and agree with, with the culture. culture. And, and I, I found that question so interesting uh, because if, if we stop and think about it, when, when people's beliefs line up exactly with the, the pop culture around us uh, or, or whatever, whatever kind of culture, culture around us, when, when people's beliefs match up exactly with the majority view, is, is it really, really that, that they were persuaded that it was true by some, some kind of evidence, evidence that something, some, some new piece of information came along and changed the mind? Or is, or is there something more at work in our hearts that, that makes us believe the things we want to believe? believe? And, and what we want to believe is often affected not by evidence, but by, by other people's opinions. And, and so, so uh, I, think I think very often there are many of our beliefs, and for us too as Christians, many of our beliefs are ultimately um, accidentally grounded in what we wish or want to be true. And those beliefs need to be examined. And many of those desires that shape our beliefs are desires that are not about love for God, but rather about other loves, and that's what the Bible calls sin. So that's why Peter says they follow their own sinful desires in verse 3. So the specific objection to Christianity that Peter foresees and predicts in the last days of these scoffers centered on the Bible's prophecies that Jesus is going to come again, that Jesus is coming back one day. Why that objection in particular? Why do, why do scoffers pick on that one? Well, the Bible says, as Peter has taught in 1 Peter, certainly, but also in 2 Peter chapter 2 in particular, uh, uh, that, that Jesus is, is coming back one day, day to judge the living and the dead. Look, look what Peter said in, in 2 Peter, Peter chapter, chapter 2, verse 9. He says, says then, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment. Um, so, so people, people in, in, in our culture are generally not offended by the caricature of Jesus as a nice and gentle and sensitive teacher. Uh, Jesus, uh, with, with the, the you know the, the you know uh, blonde, blonde hair and blue eyes and gentle, gentle way with children, children is, is not particularly offensive to anybody. Um, and, and but, but Jesus, as, as Peter, Peter is described, Jesus is the judge. What, what the Bible, Bible says about Jesus is coming back again to judge, judge the living and the dead, uh, that, that he has, has the right. right to judge everyone in the world, whether they are currently alive or currently dead. That truth of Scripture, that teaching of Scripture about Jesus, is deeply offensive to people in our culture and people all around the world. Well, the scoffers' objections are really interesting. If you, if you look with me at verse 4, what the scoffers begin to say is so interesting. But before we do that, let's look at why I think it's interesting. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 22, um, it, it says, says when, when a prophet, prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that, that is a word that the Lord has not spoken. The, the prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. And an untrue prediction uh, proves that a prophet is not speaking for God. And therefore, uh, in Deuteronomy, it says, therefore, you don't need to listen to him. An untrue pro uh, prediction proves that this prophet is not speaking for God, according to the Bible. Uh, so, so now look at verse 4. Second uh, chapter 3, verse 4. Here's, here's what the scoffers will say. They will say, Where is the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as they were from the beginning of creation. And, and exactly the point that they're bringing up is, it was predicted that Jesus would come again, but, but so, so far, far there's no evidence. Where, where is he? The predictions are wrong. He has, has not come, come back again. again. And, and, and an untrue prediction proves that a prophet is not speaking for God. God. See, See, Jesus and his apostles predicted that, that Jesus, Jesus would come, come again. again. Jesus and his apostles uh, banked on that. They, they, they made those predictions. 
and uh, followers of Christ have been counting on those predictions, waiting for Jesus to return for 2,000 years. And it's, it's been a long time, and still he hasn't come back. Does that mean the Bible's wrong? Well, not necessarily, no. I would say maybe even stronger, of course it doesn't. There, there are, are many, many predictions in the Bible, Bible that have come true, that have been fulfilled, fulfilled as predicted. And, and many, many pro prophecies, prophecies and predictions about ancient, ancient events were, were, fulfilled. were fulfilled. Many, many prophecies, prophecies and predictions about Jesus' first advent, advent about his first, first coming, were, were fulfilled. And, and as, as I've been teaching in our sermon, sermon series uh, through, through the book of Revelation over the, over the last couple of years, years, many prophecies, uh, even, even in the book, book of Revelation and also in Daniel, about, about the interval between Jesus' first and second advent have also been fulfilled. Uh, with, with all these predictions that are, are fulfilled and have come true, um, I, I think that should be enough to make a person at least think, to make a person consider and evaluate. But these scoffers are not interested in evidence that the Bible is true. They don't want the Bible to be true. Peter goes on then next to expose uh, their folly by showing how they ignore the Bible's testimony regarding even facts that are scientifically verifiable uh, because they don't want the Bible to be true. So Peter exposes their folly. If you need to know, and this is, this is who Peter's writing to, he's writing to his beloved readers, he's writing to people who believe in Christ, people who want to, to believe in Christ. Christ. He's looking for, for people who are looking for reasons to believe. If, if you, you want to, to believe, and if, if you want, want to know that it is reasonable to, to believe God's word, the answer is yes, as, as Peter shows. shows. Look, look with me at verses 5 and 6. For, for they, they deliberately overlook this fact, fact that the, the heavens, heavens existed long ago, and the earth, earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that, and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. To counter the, the arguments from, from the scoffers, Peter cites uh, both the fact of creation and the fact of the flood that we call Noah's flood as evidence. And again, Peter points out something regarding their motivation. He says they deliberately overlooked this fact in, in, in verse 5. I have read countless essays and articles uh, papers uh, by, by scientists uh, showing scientists who happen to be Christians showing how many of the Earth's features and, and, and fossils uh, are better explained by the sudden and rapid effects of the flood that we call Noah's flood than by billions of years of gradual processes. Uh, and, and, and those are those are the two opposing beliefs that I think are really clear in our time uh, regarding Earth's history. It's either billions of years of things happening just as slowly as they happen nowadays, or, on the other hand, according to the Bible, sudden, violent, global, seismic upheaval and rapid burial by water only a few thousand years ago, as Genesis 7 describes. Peter isn't trying to convince scoffers to, to believe the Bible here. And, and these kind of ways of looking at science from a Christian point of view is also not going to convince uh, hardly any scoffers out there. Uh, he's not trying to do that. He's just trying to show believers how willing scoffers are to ignore the evidence that doesn't fit their conclusions, to ignore the evidence that they don't want to look at, they don't want to see, to ignore the evidence that might lead to conclusions they don't want it to be true. And Peter wants to help believers remember God's Word. Verse 2, that's what verse 2 is about, remembering God's Word. Now look again at verses 5 and 6. For they deliberately overlook this fact, that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. And that, that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged with water and perished. It says creation and the flood were both caused by God's word. By God's word, by his speaking. Now, I love science, 
but, but, but science, science has, has limits to what it can test and what it can verify. It is great at observing and testing uh, in the present, but, but it, it can only unearth clues about what, what happened in the past. past. And, and clues require interpretation, and interpretations depend on personal assumptions. Therefore, how should believers respond to unbelieving scoffers? That's the question. We should not call them liars and, and tell them they're, they're, they're going to be judged uh, and, and sort of hurled that in their faces. That's not helpful. Uh, that's not the approach that Peter takes either. We should warn, but we should do so in love. And we should do so persuasively. And we should try to do so with education and reason. And we should try to do so with affection. And we should try to do so with something. Those are all good ambitions. But, but how should we respond in our hearts to, to, to unbelieving scoffers who mock God's word? Whose word should we trust? Should we be affected by what scoffers scoff at? Should we be moved and shaken by that? The opinions and the guesses of men and women who don't want Jesus to come again and don't want God to judge them, should we let their opinions and their guesses shake the things, the things that, that we believe because God's, God's word says so? Or should, should we trust the, the testimony of God, whose word brought the universe into existence and, and, and brought, brought judgment upon the pre flood world? Who should, should we believe? In verse 7, seven Peter goes, goes on to show that Jesus is going to have the last word. word. Uh, look at verse 7 with me. But, but by, by the same word, again, again the word of God, the heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Geological science can see, and there's evidence, and geological science observes the evidence of massive hydraulic processes, water and water pressure, all over the planet. The, the, the Creation Answers book, and you can, you can get a copy, an e-book or a hard copy from creation.com. The Creation Answers book says all around the world, in rock layer after rock layer, we find billions of dead things that have been buried in water-carried mud and sand. Billions of dead things buried in water-carried mud and sand. And the very fact that so many fossils are intact, including leaves, and, and even jellyfish. Uh, the very fact that the leaves of jellyfish are preserved as fossils rather than slowly decayed and just vanished. The very fact that we find these, these kinds of fossils, much less skeletons, uh, and has, been, has become almost routine. Dinosaur bones with uh, um, gooey tissue still preserved inside them. The very fact that, 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 that there's so much evidence of rapid burial being quickly buried by, by layers and layers of sediment and preserved and sealed before they could rot and decompose. This evidence paints a frightening picture of how the ancient world was judged and destroyed by water at God's command. That fact, as science begins to unearth more and more of that evidence, that fact should make people at least willing to consider and evaluate and then ask the questions, and then think. That, that fact, fact should get people to do a second check. It should be enough. But, but as verse 7, seven says, says, as, as Peter, Peter prophesies, in the future, the, the world will be judged and destroyed in fire, again, by God's word, by his command. And when will that happen? Peter, Peter says it will happen in verse 7, at the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. Just, Just as surely as there was a creation, that, that, that there is a world, there is a God who created it. And just, Just as surely as there was a flood, there will be a second coming of Christ. And as surely as Jesus is Lord and Savior, he is also judge. Therefore, my, my, my brothers, brothers and sisters, sisters in Christ, these beloved who Peter writes to, believers in Jesus, that's, that's who I'm talking to this morning. 
Therefore, those of you who believe in him, and, 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 and I, I guess, guess also those of you who have yet to believe in him, but who want to believe, let's devote ourselves to learning and remembering all that the prophets have spoken in verse 2, all that has been commanded by Christ through his apostles, uh, verse 2, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Let's, let's devote ourselves to learning and remembering the prophets and the apostles. Let our confidence, let our confidence in Jesus and our loving obedience to Jesus produce in us awe, yes, and joy, happiness in our hearts. This kind of a Christian life has to be a supernatural life that depends on God's enabling power in us. Let's believe like this, as Paul wrote in Galatians 2. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let's pray. Father, we do this morning and I refresh our faith in Jesus Christ. Stir us up by way of these reminders of the truthfulness of your word, the faithfulness of your word, the power of your word. That, that, Lord, we would remember, remember that, that there is so much evidence that, that you are our creator. There is so much evidence of your creation and of the truth claims of the Bible that have been fulfilled and verified again and again and again, even, even pro prophetic uh, predictions, predictions in, in the scripture. And so, Lord, let us uh, be encouraged by these things now to remember that as you speak, it is true. We believe, Lord, we believe your word. Because we know and we have come to see that you are trustworthy. We believe in Jesus because we have come to believe, as the scripture has revealed him, that he is trustworthy, that he is your son, that his claims were true. And we have seen those claims verified by the fact that you raised him from the dead. And so now we know, as he predicted, that he is coming again to judge the living and the dead. Lord, would you allow this encouragement this morning to be used to strengthen our confidence in Jesus so that on the day of his return, we might be found expectant, waiting, and believing and trusting in him. Let, us, let us this happen in us by your grace, by your merciful Holy Spirit, and by your great power. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for joining me. Next week we'll carry on in, in uh, 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, beginning in verse 8. And uh, tomorrow, Saturday, we have at 9 a.m. a Theology for Breakfast discussion uh, around the Bible. And these days, uh, specifically, we're using uh, a new book by John Piper called Coronavirus and Christ to guide our thinking about what Scripture says about God and how we should think about this coronavirus pandemic. You can get a, a copy of that book and join us. I think we're in chapter 5 or 6, and don't worry, they're very short chapters. Uh, chapter, chapter 5 or 6 in the morning, morning. Um, I, I can't, can't remember, remember which chapter, chapter but you'll have to maybe prepare for both. both. And you, you can get, get your own copy of that book uh, as a free ebook by visiting desiringgod.org and just look, look there for the book Coronavirus and Christ by John Piper. Tomorrow morning you can find this live stream uh, discussion and theology uh, group uh, here on YouTube on our YouTube channel. If, if you're not looking at this, this on our YouTube, YouTube channel right now, you can get to our YouTube channel by going to bcchurch.ca and looking down at the bottom right corner of your screen and you'll see a little red YouTube icon. Click on that, that'll take you to our channel. The live stream will come on at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning and you can join us for that as we read and discuss Coronavirus and Christ by Dr. John Piper. Until then, God bless you.